estamos viviendo el comienzo de algo muy diferente. Necesitamos entender el presente de otra manera para poder vivir el futuro. Si me preguntaran cómo definiría el futuro con una sola palabra, diría que es o va a ser impactante. Porque nos va a impactar en toda nuestra vida, en todo lo que hacemos. Y si tuviera que, o me dijeran, o me dejaran decir una segunda palabra para definir ese futuro, les diría que apasionante. Apasionante porque si lo hacemos bien, el mundo puede ser diferente y puede ser mejor. Lo ha comentado Our regional minister, Joaquín Bideraz, just said that, as did the Secretary General. The fourth industrial revolution is going to transform humankind because it's not going to just change what we do, but it's going to change who we are because there's going to be a coming together of technologies and humans are going to be tied into what is digital and the biological and technological world. We're all going to be together. And this way of seeing things means that we're heading towards a scenario which is characterized by an automated, a cognitive world. A world in which there's a great deal of connectivity, where we have immediate access to data. 5G is already here, and people are now working on 6G. But above all, we're going to be connected to everything. You've all heard about the Internet of Things, and we're now working towards the Internet of Everything. But in the future, we'll have the Internet of Feelings, where we, people, our sensory organs, are going to control the whole of our surroundings. And how exciting is that? And to face this future, there are three strategies to face this future. One is just to live in the past and just become irrelevant. Just, you know, see what happens. You know, things will go back to the way they were. For me, that's just being lazy or sloppy. Or we can adapt and survive. Okay, that's conformity. Or we can transform, innovate and face the future. I'd call that being damn brave. Because the future isn't, we're not waiting for it, we're not expecting it to come, we face it. And that's what we're doing today. And we're going to explain a little bit about that to you today. So to do that, to face the future, we need to prepare people for disruptive change. Things that we don't know about, and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to see that future together through those people that are trained. Any transformational change in humankind has always brought us challenges. And how do we face those challenges? Via setting goals, setting objectives. And when you set a goal, it sounds a bit like a straight, a straight, straight line, which may go uphill a little bit, but actually we all know that that's not what happens. There are good times when you're heading towards your goal, there are bad times, there are times when things are going really well, and other times when you just want to throw the towel in and forget it. So that's like this wiggly line where we try to find the way out to get to our ultimate goal. And that means that life has a huge unpredictability coefficient. And this huge unpredictability coefficient means that life provides us with infinite possibilities. We can do many, many things, actually many more than you think. And this brings us on to two concepts what is inevitable and what is unexpected. There are some things in life which are un unavoidable, inevitable, and others which are completely unexpected. This horrible pandemic that we experienced was totally unexpected. And yet there are other things that are unavoidable. For example, if we think of Japan, we know that there's going to be major earthquakes in Japan. We know that. So what do they do? They get prepared. They've got their buildings built to withstand these earthquakes. So they know that something that's unexpected and also inevitable won't 
catch them unawares. We know that the level of the sea is increasing, the level of the oceans is increasing. And that's unavoidable, but people are already working so that when the level of the sea does rise, we are prepared and countries aren't flooded. And things aren't, don't come unexpected. A more graphic example, perhaps. If you're in an aeroplane, you're flying along, and there are two pilots in the aeroplane, the pilot and the co-pilot, they're having a chat about football. And they're just saying that the Real Sociedad team in San Sebastian is first in the league, in the Spanish league. They're talking about that, and all of a sudden they hear, boom! And the, the left engine is exploded, so the pilot says, no, it doesn't matter, we'll just uh, connect that, we'll use the extinct, we'll put the uh, uh, fire out, don't worry, we'll, we'll fire up the second engine, and we'll get to the uh, airport. But then, bang, the second engine, okay, right, no, it doesn't matter, we'll get that fire put out, we'll start uh, planing down, gliding down, and then the co-pilot says, oh, oh, I think a wing's about to drop off now. And it says, don't worry, we'll tell the crew we're going to have an emergency landing. So they tell the crew we're going to be in emergency landing. They're all ready. They're, and there's a passenger in the plane who's just relaxing, opens his eyes. Oh, there's something, what, what's going on here? And he says to the hostess, I'm so sorry, but are we going to land now? And the hostess says, yes, we're going to take an awful lot of land. So what's inevitable is that the la aeroplane is going to land. But what's unexpected is that they were prepared. The fourth industrial revolution is unavoidable, but what we can't be is caught out on the hoof. We can't be caught out not expecting that this is going to happen. And this is what we're trying to do in VET in the Basque countries. So what we need to do to do that is to generate expectations and expectations in society in general so that they can understand what's going on, what may happen, that may well be very positive, and in throughout the whole of VET, which is what we're talking about here. And of course, in all amongst all our students and amongst all our teachers who are the most important if we're going to get these feelings across to our students. And when we create expectations, the first thing that you need to do is think about what you want to do. The second thing you need to do is to think about what you can do. And thirdly, what are you going to do? And perhaps even more uh, important is what people think you're doing or perceive that you're doing. That's what people are going to look at. And why do I say that? Because you create, you generate expectations, which is what drives forward motivation. And what motivation does is it proves, it moves forward the enthusiasm of the people. And if you meet your goals, you create prestige, credibility, and trust. But if you don't, if you don't meet these expectations, that's the problem. That's why you've got to create the expectations properly. So you need to define what you're going to do, you need to walk your talk, and what's even more important, you need to prove that you're walking your talk. So what I want to try to do today is to prove how we're working in vocation education and training, which you will be able to see this afternoon and check that we're doing it right on the tours this afternoon. So we've created expectations, people are more or less paying attention, and then you get all these different opinions popping up. It's like when you're in a tunnel and you see a light at the end of the tunnel, and the pessimist pops up and says, oh, this is a train that's just coming towards us. You can see its lights. But the optimist says, no, 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 that's us coming out of the tunnel. It's the light at the end of the tunnel. And the realist says, oh, I'm just going to stay here and see if that light moves. If the light moves, it's a train coming towards you. If the light doesn't move, it's the exit to the tunnel. And there's the fourth it's the one that's driving the train who says, what are those three dimwits doing on the train tracks? So there are four different viewpoints about a light at the end of a tunnel. That's the way things are. And we also know that if we can manage expectations well, there'll be different viewpoints. And that's what happens. And we know that there are people that are drowning in problems, and there are also there are people that swim, that like floating around in opportunities. So we need to create all the opportunities that we can. And those people that are swimming in those problems or drowning those problems can also get hold of a life raft which represents an opportunity. It's not just a matter of seeing the glass half empty or the glass half full. No, what we need to know is whether we're filling that glass or emptying that glass. That's what's important because this is down to 
uh, personal accountability and general accountability in all of these changes and transformations that we're going to have to go through. So the word that I want to talk about today is to is transform. We need to transform. We need to change. We are changing. We are transforming. If you look back in history, when humankind has taken a great leap forward, it's always been in a very convulsive moment, a very difficult moment. And I think we're going through a difficult moment at the current time, and it's going to carry on. But what's important is that then there will be huge leap forwards, and these will benefit humankind. So future is always a continuous movement. It's something that never ends. That means that a stata static system will never operate in a continually changing um, world. So we need dynamic systems, dynamic colleges, and dynamic VET. That's why we in the Basque government are working on three <coughs> transitions with a very, very important goal. Our regional minister said that. Human sustainable development three, through, through three transformations, digital technological transition, energy and environmental transition. <coughs> I think three weeks ago, the Secretary General of the UN said, we are committing suicide. We are committing suicide. That's what the UN General Secretary said. It's no good just reducing greenhouse gases or pollution or CO2. That's insufficient. It's no, just, no, no good just recycling. What we need to is to regenerate our planet because we're committing suicide so that we can guarantee for the future generations that they're going to be able to live in this wonderful house, this wonderful house which is really our world, planet Earth. We need to change our lifestyle because otherwise the climate is going to change our lives. This is really, really important. And then a healthcare transition which obviously has been through a terrible time during the pandemic. And we are changing the healthcare system a lot because we're learning through the pandemic. Our productive fabric is being changed in the Basque country. We are resetting employment and we're adapting our training systems. And as our regional minister said, we're turning VET into smart VET. Smart VET which needs to respond to what's happening now to the needs of the people so that they can work, our students so that they can work, and the needs of our companies so that they can be competitive. And we're also working in emerging environments and things that we see through digitization we need to respond to. And also, although it may seem strange, we're also working in unknown environments because we already feel that there's a digital transformation out there. And we've got a sort of a feeling of the kind of work that we can develop, the kind of job that might be out there. So we're trying to detect, we're trying to pin the professional profiles that we're going to need in the future that are so important. Always doing so together with advanced technologies and always, and I'll repeat this time and time again, always with the support of what's most important in the squad, which is the human factor. In Basque VET, when we talk about smart VET, what we require is high performance training, high performance training, which has given us some great results thanks to the tremendous effort made by our teachers. We've got over 2,200 teachers working on these, in these technologies, over 24,000 students and 80 coordinators, all of whom are working extremely hard. And I'd like to say now, thank you. Thank you to all of these people who are putting into practice these new learning teaching methodologies. We are doing all of this in a new kind of college. Uh, very complex transformation, new buildings, new colleges, these are new VET smart colleges. We're going to, going to work in collaborative networks as we always do. Employability is going to require everybody to be far more professional because the way we are trained needs to be improved. And we also know that it's no good just trying to defend jobs. No, we need to defend people who are working. In the past, what we did was we defended a job so that a person could occupy that job, that post. No, let's now defend the worker so that that worker can uh, occupy that job or any other job that may pop up. So we're defending their, we're supporting their employability. We've debated a great deal the issue of the future. We've spoken about that with 
our companies with the Confederation of Private Companies, with their president, when we talk up with, to those companies, and we've spoken to them on many occasions, they all say the same thing. And the same thing goes when we talk about the VET uh, college organizations. We all have the same goal, which is that the future is going to require talent. Talent. Oh, that's all great. That sounds great. So this is a huge leap forward. We're now no talking about a skilled worker, a person that's doing their job properly. No, no, no. Or oh, a professional, a skilled professional. And that's great, a skilled professional, that person knows how to do things well, but you've got to add something else to that. We need a professional, a worker that can add value to what they're doing, not just do the job professionally and well. And what's more, we need to take a further leap, and that's what we're doing now. What we need is talented professional. I'm sure you've seen many, many definitions of talent, but we need to apply those definitions. How can we get talent out of our classrooms? It's true, talent is innate. It's true, but you can train talent. And what we do in our classrooms is train that talent. How do we do that? Firstly, we get uh, talented people need five components. Firstly, there's a cultural component. They need to understand what's happening in life, in their surroundings. They need to understand. They've got to have general culture, general knowledge. They need to have a scientific component. They want to understand the why and the what for of things. Then a technological component, because these people are going to use an awful lot of technology, very different technology as time goes by. A professional uh, component as well. Of course, they need to be the best professionals in the world. And finally, and perhaps this is the most important, a personal component. Component. That is values, human values applied to the world of employment. Those are five components that we need if we want our people to have talent. And in this high performance trend that we set, I'd add we need to work on uh, critical thought. We're very good, but we also need to work on constructive thought. It's no good just saying, I don't like this, this isn't working. You need to do is then find some kind of constructive thought about how to get that to work, and then creative thought. Now that you've said, oh, okay, you can do things that'll uh, work, why don't you try thinking about something else? That's creativity, and that means you need to work on three kinds of intelligence. Emotional intelligence, generative intelligence, you need to have ideas, select from this list of ideas and decide which ideas you're going to use, and executive intelligence, that is, do it, walk that talk. And in addition to that, you see up here, soft skills. These are cross-cutting skills. We're working on 24 soft skills. You can see them on the screen. For example, here we're working on planning, uh, complex problem solving, curiosity or interest. We're very interested in that. Applied innovation. But we're also working on, for example, imagination, integration in roboticized environments. How do you face changes? You need to be able to face changes at any given in moment in time. It sounds easy, but it's not. We're also working on stress management. People need to know how to manage their stress if they're in a co at a complicated moment, or they need to have the ability to concentrate on their lifelong learning because we now know that you need to transform yourself all the time because of the technological revolution and of the processes that are going to be involved in this. This part, this part of uh, concentrating learning is like a parachute. You either open your mind or it's not going to work. Same as a parachute. You've got to have an open mind. So we need to work on Cognitive flexibility. You need to be open to understand what kind of knowledge you're going to need in different surroundings. So we're working on those 24 skills as well, these soft skills. And that's going to make us different from machines and robots. We've got soft skills, but three important things as well. Intuition emotion and our ability to improvise. These are three keys which are going to give us a humanistic leadership and set us apart from machines. So we've got to have all of this together with these three elements, intuition, the ability to improvise and emotion, and that's what will give us humanist leadership heading for the future. 
that means that the way we organise our colleges needs to be very, very different. We can't bring about all these transformations if we just organise our colleges in the same way, if they just carry on with the same structure. So what are we working on? These smart VET centres are driving forward a digital transformation. We work with advanced technologies and we are now developing in our colleges different spaces, which makes it possible for us to work in a different way. Work in a different way on the digital transformation that I mentioned earlier. Digital transformation, we shouldn't confuse that with digitization. I'm not talking about digitization. Digitization is applied technology to a space, to a thing. I've got a camera, I've got a computer, I've got a screen. I can make a video, I can provide online training. That's space digitization. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about digital transformation. I'm talking about changing the whole of the VET system from the bottom upwards, from the way we train our teachers to the way we give classes, everything. Our regional minister said something really, really clear, which is that the education department is going to all of the education department work on digital transformation. Here I've got my colleague here with me, the uh, Deputy Minister for Education, who is going through digital transformation in the whole of the education system, right from kindergarten to university. My also colleague uh, in charge of uh, university, Adolf Omarais, who's working with universities to also bring about this digital transformation. Or my colleague, Xavier Azpuro, who's got the hardest job, which is to negotiate and sell that idea to the Treasury Department so we get the money to carry out this digital transformation. These all four are working together. And when we talk about vocational education and training, VET, my minister said to me, we need to be at the cutting edge of digital transformation. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to be at the cutting edge of digital transformation. But to be so, we need a strategy. But we've prepared our strategy. And we're now working in 70 smart colleges in the Basque Autonomous Region. By the year 2024, we'll have 70 smart colleges. There are currently 24 that are being worked on. The, we call them smart VET centers, but there'll be 70 in the end. And what we do is we understand our strategy, we're changing our infrastructures, we're changing the organization. I'll, I'll explain that to you in a minute. We're working with new digital spaces, we're applying smart systems, and we're going to invest an awful lot of money in training our teaching staff because we need our teaching staff to be digital experts. We're working on which processes can be digitized and which digital tools we need. This is what we've developed in our strategy, and now we're applying that strategy into our 24 colleges that I've just mentioned. To do that, the college structures has like a, a three departments in it. One is the strategy department, the other is the innovation department, and the other is the operational department. Overarching that, we've got the management board. And there we've got knowledge areas. I've got all kinds of uh, teachers, and I'm a teacher, by the way. We know all these departments. And what we're going to do is replace departments with what we've called cross-cutting knowledge areas. Because there's no point in having a department of automotion and a department of mechanical manufacturing or a department of IT or sports sciences because now if you're mixing all the different areas where we work we're talking about um, people that work in the healthcare sector uh, dealing with people that have uh, specific needs or the IT field needs to work and collaborate with autom the automotive department so teachers need to work interdepartmentally. These are what we call the cross-cutting knowledge areas. We work on applied research and in VET. In the last two and a half years, almost three years now, we've worked in our VET colleges with over 3,300 companies. And what we've managed to do is to implement over 1,000 applied innovation projects for products and for processes in our VET colleges, which is, that's really important. But if now look at entrepreneurship, our VET colleges per year create between 90 and 100 companies. Over the last 12 years, we've set up over 11 hundred companies in VET colleges and 70% of them today still are up and running. 
Look now at these diagrams and you'll see here at the bottom, you've got our, the management team, our uh, strategic uh, manager with his team, the operational manager with his team, the equality team, and we also have another person, which is the change driver. A change driver is a person within a college who's going to encourage people to really drive forward all the changes that need to come about. The final uh, structure, and this is the structure that we get, we're aiming for, and you can see the work that you're doing if you look at this slide, because on the right what you've got, and we're looking at how the collaborative teams all work to, together, all the different uh, sections work together, and how the innovation and strategy teams then develop things after having observed, setting out uh, the strategy, and once you know what the strategy is, you then add other possibilities, do things in a different way, generate the value that we're going to need to respond to the different uh, college environments so the operational section can now make things happen. That's the approach. And it's a transformation that you are helping us bring about. And it's spectacular. It's a lot of work. I know it's a lot of hard work. I'm really well aware of it. But we need you to carry on working like that if we're going to bring about this transformation, which is so complex. What's more, in our colleges, in these 24 colleges, we've got digital transformation teams. What we do is we organize um, people who drive for forward digital transformation. We've got what we call the uh, those that drive that forward, we've got digital teachers and those that are in charge of digital infrastructures. Altogether, they coordinate with the different uh, coordinators of active and learning methods. As I said, we work on challenge-based collaborative learning. This is all connected to digital transformation teams as well. And what's more, these spaces are like levers for transformation. We're changing our spaces. We're changing our classrooms. It's important to modify in our colleges the spaces that we have in the college. I'm going to start a talk about talking about digital spaces. We'll see artificial intelligence. We're going to see lots of things this afternoon, but we're working on advanced technologies now, which are technologies that are already there to be implemented. For example, there are interactive, immersive, intelligent technologies. There's artificial intelligence, connectivity, 5G. We're working on that. Data analysis and management, thanks to big data, or cybersecurity labs, which we're also going to try uh, to work on. And you'll see that in our colleges and blo blockchain applications so that we're doing things properly. If I now concentrate just for a moment on these high performance centers, and I'm going to show you the first video first, you can see in these high performance spaces what students need to do, first of all, is capture the information that they need, then analyze that information in a different place. They can analyze that information on their own or together with the group. Then there's a third space where they work on the different possibilities, the different alternatives that are out there. What can I do with this information that I have? What can I do once I've analyzed this information? Because there's a challenge there. I've, you get the information, you analyze the information, see if you can do something differently, and then you start working on prototypes. You can work on your own on prototypes or with other people on prototypes. We tend to do things as a team here. And then you work with uh, technology, because prototypes are there to see whether what you've thought about will actually work or not. And then you go from prototype to the end product. And that's where you really, um, uh, really, really everything is on the line. This is what, uh, how we approach things in our high performance spaces. If we then look at uh, smart warehouses and smart workshops, you'll see these are machines that are connected to each other, that are connected also to the cloud, and their students and teachers connect with their companies digitally to make something manufactured, to work with each other, and this is all done digitally, automatically. 
They're also going to work with robots. But as you can see, we've got smart warehouses. If a teacher or student goes into that warehouse and to pick up a tool, we know who's picked up their tool, which tool it is, and we know where that tool is so that it never gets lost. We know where the person that's taking it is as well. These are smart systems, and they're all organized in such a way using what we call a 5S system, which is a Japanese 5S system. So you scan your card, they take the tool away that they need, and we now know who's got that, and if somebody needs it afterwards, they don't have to go to the warehouse and find it, but they can go where it is. Let's talk about interactive digital smart spaces. This is another video here. These are spaces which are 100% digitalized. Digital walls, 360 degree digital walls and digital tables where you interact with them. You'll see this, by the way, this is in a specific um, college that's in Vergara where we're trialing the system. We're gonna, we've got 33 of these uh, to see how we can work with them, how teachers and students can work in 100% digit digitized surroundings. These are uh, tables where you can send information from the table to the wall or from a table that's here in San Sebastian to another uh, table in another um, college in Cadiz. That's what digitization can do. These are 360 degree screens, and so we can work, and you can see these screens, they're 360 degrees, and they always work in these uh, digital tables. So if we now move on to interactive spaces. Oh, sorry, immersive ones. I've just spoken about the interactive ones. These are immersive ones. Here you can see people that are in a space using machines and using augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. You can work, work with robots, digital twins, simulators. But what's important is you're part of the learning experience. You're inside these uh, avatars, these robots. You can see, they're seeing what you can see on the screen by the way, it's a car, you can uh, take the door apart, or you can even get inside a human body and take the human body uh, to pieces, or you can be inside the car engine, see how that engine works. So in this case, this is an, a wind turbine, and they're looking at how this wind turbine works, or a, in an operating theatre here, you can see for example, how a patient's being virtually cared for. We can also work in virtual reality, mixed reality, where there'll be people physically with other people who actually aren't physically there, who will be uh, connected virtually. We'll be even to, able to touch them. These are the new spaces that I'm talking about when I talk about vocational education and training. Also working on artificial intelligence. I'm not going to project this video because something's gone wrong with it. Of course, it's artificial intelligence. If it was a human, it wouldn't have failed. But because it's artificial intelligence, we've had a problem with the video. But what, this is really important for teachers because it turns out that artificial intelligence can help us improve performance in the classroom. You can use more data, but it turns out that if you use artificial vision, you can actually capture people's emotions. You can see whether a group of students is no longer interested in the class, and the professor can tell that. They can realize that and change the class. We can do things, we can detect things that we hadn't even thought would be possible in the past, and we're working on them now, so as to be able to apply them, to be able to see how far we can go with that, and research with this to see whether it can be applied and here of course ethics has a really important role to play and then cyber security labs I'm hoping that this video will work here you can see how we're working with something as simple which is, is to defend us from possible cyber attacks we're talking about machines connected to each other via the cloud imagine if they put a virus in the cloud then all of our workshop will come tumbling down so we've got cyber security labs where students and teachers know how to attack, know how to defend themselves, cyber 
are hacking in an IT environment and also in an industrial environment. We're not so worried about a virus getting in a computer. We're talking about a virus attacking a machine that is manufacturing something. You can imagine a virus could actually completely paralyze a manufacturing process and we would lose sales that way. So it's really important that our students know how important cybersecurity is and our teacher, not just the IT teachers, but of course them as well, but those that are in machining and other uh, professional areas that really need to know about that. So, when you talk about foreseeing the future or looking ahead to the future, it's not so matter uh, much an issue of improving what already exists, but rather moving towards what will be in the future. And we need to do that in a people-centered way, because we need to know what the role of the human being is going to be in the future. There's all these robots, machines, and digitization. What about our role? What's humankind's role? Well, it needs to be the most important role. Technology is there to support people, to assist people to do things better, so that we can work better. But if we work less, even better. So much the better, not the opposite. We shouldn't be living for technology, because that's a problem, because progress without humanism isn't progress, actually. You can call it whatever you want, but it's not progress. Digital transformation isn't brought about when technology has changed, but it comes about when people change their behaviors and their values. And we in BET and you is what we're doing. At least we're trying to do that. We're trying to bring that about. Something else that's really important, two people having lunch together at a break. They're having a break from a building site that's building a 20-story building. And they, one says, oh, yeah, you yeah, know, we're doing fine. We're on floor 16. And the other one says, oh, we're on the roof. And they said, do you know what happened to this Basque guy? No, 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 what Basque guy? There was a guy that came from VET who's a really good guy who's great at working. Oh, what happened to him? Well, he was on floor 16, putting up all the connectivity system, but when he went out to get a tool, it just turns out he, he slipped. He slipped, and he fell down into the security fence, and obviously he was killed. No, 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 he wasn't killed. No, I don't know what happened, but when he fell on the 14th floor, he held on with the tips of his fingers to the balcony of the 14th floor of the building. Oh, my goodness. You're not going to believe this? But as he was holding on the tips of his filling, a cart came across and ran across his uh, the fingertips and he fell down even further. Did he kill? Did he die? No. No, I don't know how. Then he fell down onto some boards or on the 12th floor and he didn't go all the way down. No, 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 thank goodness. No, you don't know the worst of it yet. The, they were flexible boards and that catapulted him upwards. And then he went down into the 11th floor. He held onto the cables that were hanging out of the 11th floor. Oh, thank goodness for that. No, 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 even worse than that. The light switch was turned on, so that gave him an electric shock, and he went down. Did he die? No. And they said, what happened? Well, can you tell me what happened at the end? Well, in the end, the firefighters came out and shot him down, because it was the only way we could get rid of him. So the thing is, you don't fail when you fall down. You fail when you give up. That's what I'm trying to say. There are going to be difficult times ahead. Because we need bad times. Because otherwise, if there were no bad times, we wouldn't know how to enjoy the good times. I know you're all working hard. We're all aware of what you're doing here. But look at how we are facing the future in, uh, F in Basque VET with a short video. I hope you enjoy it. We're heading towards the fourth towards revolution is unfolding rapidly. The fourth industrial revolution We're is unfolding rapidly. A new reality. We're experiencing and we can a new reality. Sense that the and world in 2030 will be a very different place. The fourth industrial revolution in its entirety will bring with it a new type of society, Society 5.0, in which human beings will be the primary focus. 
we must move towards a new era for humanity. We are heading towards an automated cognitive world with immediate data access in which everything will be connected to everything else. In the highly complex evolutionary process before us, only human beings know how to be human. Only people can hold values, feel, create, and adapt to the changes. Our ability to adapt has gotten us this far. We have always learned from the environment around us or from the people who are with us at different stages of our lives. We have responded to every challenge with the best possible solution. The challenge we face today is much more complex. We must respond to the situation, to a future which we are just starting to envisage. We are facing a revolution that will change society completely. Robotics, artificial intelligence, Digitalization and smart systems will transform all areas of our lives. The vast professional training sector is preparing for the exciting and complex future that awaits us. It is creating new types of smart professional training centers, which will generate a new work culture and use highly advanced technologies. They will use new methods to respond to new objectives and create smart organizational structures and workspaces. These centers will develop creative ability by building organizations with a genuine capacity for learning and creativity. They look to the future, they have ideas, they take risks, they're autonomous. They use different tools, methods and structures, but above all, they put the people within them at the center. Their ability to adapt, react, anticipate and disrupt will set them apart. Digitalization, robotics and artificial intelligence are tools that will help us to live and work better by supporting progress and well-being in our society. It is our job to prepare people for living in a complex and exciting future by developing the necessary solutions, using advanced technologies, and above all else, using what makes human beings unique, our values and our hearts. Technology may set us apart, but our hearts will allow us to transcend. Juntas. Juntos. Together. All of us, all of us that are here, all of these teachers in the Basque country, we're all doing incredible things together. Really incredible. Everything that we see on those videos is thanks to your work. I can show great videos, I can explain things, but without your work, this would just be pointless. But all of this is real, we're doing this now. And if something is making BET successful, it's the fact that we're very humble, we're very simple, and we work hard. This tremendous amount of work that you're doing to make this all move forward, always trying to do the best for the youngsters that are coming along behind us and for our productive fabric. These words, these three words allow us to drive forward something that is very fundamental. One of the most beautiful words that I know is hope. Hope. Hope that society will live better. Hope that we are going to be living in a better world. Hope that we as people live better, that we be better people. And the hope of thousands and thousands of students, of thousands and thousands of people who trust us because they hope for the best future for their sons and daughters. And that's our responsibility. We're accountable. And that's what's being done. People here in the Basque Country, in the Basque Autonomous Region, trust VET for their future. That's what I talk about when I talk about developing hope. And we know where we're going. You really need to realize that. We know where we're going and we know what we need to do. I explained just very briefly what, we've, what we're doing, but we know where we're heading, what we need to do, but we're going to need you still. We've done an awful lot of incredible things over recent years. And we've done things well, but we need you again now. And we need you to be engaged. We need you to be committed. We need you to show generosity. We need you to 
be enthusiastic. Or as my regional minister said to me recently, we're just pure emotion in VET, and it's true. Everything you explain, every time you explain to us what you're doing, every time you explain how you work, it's emotion that you get across to us. Because machines, robots, artificial intelligence, everything that you want, they can do whatever they want. Yeah, they'll be around the hall, around the corner, we're going to use them to the best of our ability. But there's something that is really important, which is perhaps the most important of everything, which is our hearts. And we, humans, have a heart. Robots don't have hearts. And they never will have, thank goodness. We apply our heart, our emotion, to the work that we want to do, to this, this progress that we want to achieve in the ET. And it's with this heart, with, which represents humanity. We need to realize that we're not just uh, progressing towards a new era of technology, that's what lots of people think. No, 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 no. We're moving towards a new era of humanity, of humankind. That's where our work lies. We know that our work in education, in vocational education training, is to prepare people, prepare people who can change the world. That's where the strength of education lies. That's our strength. We prepare people who can change the world. We prepare people first so they can be good professionals afterwards. That's what makes us strong. And when we're in the classroom, when we're with our students, it's not just getting across to them knowledge, it's getting across to them who we are, what we feel, what our values are. And we get across, in addition to that, our knowledge. That's where our strength lies, and that's where we can get them to trust us, and that's where you are working hard. That's why you are working, and that's why I'm thankful to you. That's our strength. Because we're applying our heart to everything that we do. This little heart that's up on the screen. Because at the end of the day, it's true, yes, you know, technology will make us stand out above others, and I'm sure it will do. But what's really important in the video you saw that is that, that it's our heart that will make us transcend, it will make us go beyond. So, the future is going to be exciting, but we need to conquer the future. That's what's really important, and it's when we conquer it, we'll do it a lot better than, we, than machines can do it. So, go for it. Enjoy this event. I do wish you the best. And uh, an enormous hug to everybody that's out there.